Hi everyone, my name is Teodor Mitev and in this lecture I will discuss the darker side of the network society paradigm. The next lecture is titled Dark Fiber Exploits Botnet's Cyber War and it is related to the previous lecture on uh, anonymous resistance and the origins of uh, hacking um, and uh, uh, the early internet. So in this lecture we're continuing uh, that trope and examining um, first uh, the, 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 the primary logic here of the emergence of this phenomenon and also uh, then moving on to uh, the phenomenon of uh, exploits and botnets and finally to cyber war. So let's begin with retracing our steps as usual. Um, the key uh, issue here when it comes to the network society paradigm is that uh, uh, as we've already encountered uh, a number of times in the cycle of lectures, uh, we are dealing with a social structure made of information networks and this is a global bioelectronic environment which makes it susceptible to uh, what we will be discussing uh, in this lecture with, to, to uh, electronic uh, attacks, to hacking. Uh, the new economy that emerges from this paradigm is characterized by, uh, among others, uh, uh, global information flow. So again, always already this is a global economy, it's a global paradigm. And decentralized operations. So. Uh, uh, small groups of decentralized actors can uh, wreak havoc on the entire network because of the decentralized nature of, of the network itself. The type of uh, social life that emerges, and we've already discussed this uh, previously in the cycle of lectures, is um, characterized uh, among others by uh, the, the phenomenon of uh, personal information spaces, uh, which uh, um, lead to what we described as presence bleed, the, the obliteration of the personal boundary between the physical space where we are and uh, the network space, and the chronic task of sorting information. So that we are in effect continuously uh, connected to the network, continuously routing information. And uh, for our intents and purposes, the key phenomena here is that uh, the network, uh, you know, the, the global information network we are constantly uh, describing here and mapping um, remembers all information, right? So uh, the internet doesn't have an uh, uh, off button when it comes to, to information that has found its way there, right? The internet is a river of copies. So uh, the moment something is online, chances are a version of that something will be online uh, forever until uh, the internet exists. Um, this is this has really important implications. Uh, also, uh, we talked about uh, the fact that you know we, uh, about presence bleed and personal information spaces. Uh, if something is connected is, uh, to to the internet is part of the network, that that node has to now route uh, information, so it has to make itself open. To information flows, which uh, of course is a great strength of that distributed network, but it's also a vulnerability. So we will talk about this down the track in this lecture. Um, the data that is being uh, created in the process of routing and processing and, and, and creating information on the network is uh, by definition infinitely recombinant. So it can be uh, uh, stored and combined in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and again, as, as uh, Stuart Brandt famously quipped, uh, it, it wants to be free. So the result here is that uh, we end up with these giant stacks of information. We already talked about this in previous uh, lectures in the cycle where uh, uh, you know, we have these walled gardens where that information is uh, uh, leveraged and uh, surplus value is extracted from it, right? predictive value. And when, when you think of the, that information, this includes uh, everything that we've ever uploaded online. Right? So as, as a node in the network, uh, we are continuously uh, uh, creating content, we're continuously contributing content. Um, even when we think we are passive, right? We're still informing the network about our existence. So all of this information 
uh, is, is stored somewhere, it exists, right? Uh, and it can be recombined in all sorts of uh, important ways in order to extract extra predictive value. And the, it's important here to understand how, uh, because um, uh, many people, when, when uh, 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 confronted with uh, the implications of uh, what we're about to discuss in, in this lecture, usually react in a way where they are sort of building some sort of artificial boundary between the virtual and the real. And the important thing to understand is that this boundary no longer exists. Uh, it did exist uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, the internet, but it does not exist anymore, right? So the internet permits each and every facet of our lives. And uh, everything is recorded, right? Uh, so uh, all the information we generate is a permanent record, which is stored somewhere in the cloud. Uh, and it's, uh, we talked about this before when we discussed uh, walled gardens and uh, eye fielders. Um, the, the, the ability to store all this data um, is, is far outpacing uh, um, all other developments. So as a result, um, it's much cheaper actually to store the data and figure out what to do with it down the track than to uh, figure out what to keep and what to delete, right? So as an effect, what happens is that we have this continuous um, uh, development where, where uh, whatever information is put online is just kept there. And this is a dynamic of, of uh, total surveillance, right? Um, surveillance, which is uh, uh, potentiated by the data, by the, the rise of predictive algorithms, and by uh, uh, the ability to monetize these predictive algorithms. So, uh, again, we talked about the centralized world gardens, we talked about the stacks, and the key thing to understand here is that the more uh, the, the, the larger the role of the stacks in our daily life, uh, the more the vulnerabilities of the stacks become our own vulnerabilities in terms of not only individuals, but also social organization, political organization, uh, economic organization. So the, it's really important to keep this dynamic in mind when we talk about exploits and botnets and cyber warfare, because these phenomena are inex inex inextricably linked together, right? This is a systemic phenomenon that, that it, it's important to understand it systemically. So we have the stack, right, emerging. So these are vertically integrated walled gardens, hundreds of millions of users, proprietary operating system. Uh, it's uh, organized and, and positioned itself, or uh, each and every stack for that matter, positions itself as a, a safe and clean space, right, unlike the messy internet uh, and we have entire generations of people now who have grown up in stack ecologies who do not actually for, for intents and purposes know or care for the open internet who find the open internet confusing and messy or anything even resembling remotely the open internet who are completely normalized and conditioned within the, the environment of the feudal world garden and this these generations of people are the main product of the stack. They're the livestock of the stack, right? So they form the raw material for the behavioral data which the stack extracts and monetizes on behavior of future markets for their predictive power. So far, so good. But the important thing here is that uh, uh, these sanitized ecologies are, are tremendously vulnerable. And, the, and uh, the most centralized these sanitized ecologies, and they are, uh, as we know, all of them are very, very, very highly integrated, very uh, vertically centralized networks, the more vulnerable they are, and the more vulnerable uh, the, the, the individuals who are their livestock, and also the societies who are um, more and more integrating uh, themselves around uh, uh, this, this uh, phenomenon. And so this, this is our starting point, this vulnerability of, of uh, the stack. And as a reminder, we have also the emergence of hacking culture uh, with the early internet. In, initially, it has this playful element to it, uh, anarchic mode of operations, it's built around anonymity, 
there is no centralized uh, voice identity or oversight when it comes to to uh, the phenomena. Uh, uh, it's always already global because the network is global. Uh, the primary value here is knowledge and the, uh, uh, as, and the, this this notion of the exploit that we're uh, discussing in this uh, lecture. It's all uh, fu fundamentally it it's uh, knowledge, right? The knowledge of uh, uh, a way to subvert an algorithm or the knowledge of a way to subvert the defenses of a system, the knowledge of a way to uh, uh, penetrate the ports of a specific machine. Right? So this is the primary value uh, uh, and the valorization vector uh, when it comes to hacking. And uh, uh, exploits here are ad hoc discoveries which are automatically monetized and, and leveraged either for social capital or directly for some sort of monetary reward. And uh, in the traditional, uh, originary, let's call it, hacking culture, we have this phenomenon of sharing and reciprocity, which um, today has uh, more or less completely disappeared, right? So we have uh, uh, everything being uh, uh, monetized. So this is our starting point. Now let's look at uh, this phenomenon of exploits and botnets. And first, um, we need to understand what is a botnet and uh, we're starting with botnets because the botnet is uh, pretty much the, the the starting point when thinking about uh, large uh, uh, exploit slash hacking operations on the internet today so what is a botnet a botnet is uh, a, a number of computers and a network usually in the thousands or tens of thousands or, or often millions of computers which are infected with uh, remote controlled software which is created by someone by a hacker or by a group of hackers which allows so this software infecting this this huge network of computers often in the millions allows that single individual or group of people to run automated programs on all of these machines together right maximizing the payoff here because it's instead of running it from one machine you're running let's say this attack program from millions of computers simultaneously behind the important thing is that this is happening behind the user's back so you might be connecting your laptop in to the internet and wondering why your laptop is is a bit sluggish today uh, without knowing that actually your laptop is part of a botnet and it's a bit sluggish because most of its processing power is routed towards uh, whatever nefarious purpose the hacker is uh, 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 you know, using it for. So the, the remote controlled software usually is called a rootkit or some sort of Trojan, which is inserted into a computer without the knowledge of the owner of the machine, of, of the system. And uh, its, its role there is to take control of the processing power of the machine and use it for whatever purpose the, the uh, designer of the uh, exploit uh, uh, intends. So it, the, these purposes are, uh, uh, can be uh, of variety of types. So they can be as simple as simply uh, sending emails uh, with, with spam from all sorts of different IP addresses, or it can be uh, it, they can be used uh, uh, as part of uh, uh, um, operation which spreads the botnet even further, expanding these Trojans, expanding these uh, rootkits to other machines, right? so contacting other machines, let's say, in uh, uh, the, let's say the Trojan can be um, instructed to look at uh, a contact list in uh, 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 the email on the machine and uh, extracting all the emails and sending itself to other machines. Um, it can be part of uh, phishing scams or, or uh, gathering all sorts of information or part of, uh, for example, distributed denial of service attacks against uh, other machines or it, uh, the botnet can be used and recently this is uh, a popular use of botnets to mine for cryptocurrencies, right? So it can be uh, for, used for all sorts of different purposes. The main point here is that the unsuspecting owner of the machine is uh, unknown to themselves part of a uh, kind of zombie network of computers. Uh, the, the, the node on the network is zombified. So the, the, the current state of affairs when it comes to, to botnets, and this is a, a great, this, this great uh, research paper by Fred Schreier on cyber warfare, 
uh, from 2015, which uh, details basically all possible uh, uses of, uh, of uh, different exploits for, for cyber warfare purposes. Um, they are, uh, the the uh, capabilities behind uh, uh, the rootkits or Trojans that they used in botnets are very advanced. So, for example, he gives the example here of the Stormworm, which was a Trojan horse uh, spread through email and uh, creating gigantic botnets. So it, it had these advanced capabilities. It has the, uh, the uh, ability to self-morph. So to change its code to even evade antiviruses uh, uh, on the go and live. It had the self-defense capability. So uh, if you delete the, the files, it would copy itself. It had the ability to self-replicate by spreading to other machines and infecting other machines. It uh, self-encrypted its communications uh, and its uh, 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 files in order to elude signature detection. And uh, also it clogged its communication by constantly changing its ports, the ports on the machine through which it communicated in order to uh, inhibit tracking and prevent uh, the uh, you know, antivirus systems from shutting it down. So it was uh, running from anything from 20 to 115 million computers. So whoever designed this botnet, in effect, was controlling around 100 million machines at one time. Right? So you have to think here of the, of the scale and the immensity of, of this threat and the implications of that when it comes to, uh, to uh, the, the future development of the Internet. So, in effect, we are facing a situation where a uh, knowledgeable attacker or a group of uh, attackers can uh, leverage the power of... Uh, uh, millions to hundreds of millions of computers connected to the internet in order to execute uh, attacks or to use these computers for example to mine for cryptocurrency or for, for whatever other purpose they can think of right so um, th this is a highly vulnerable ecology in effect and uh, uh, for example, as you will see down the track in the lecture, there, there are price lists circulating on the internet where uh, someone can order a distributed denial of service attack against the target. And there is a price for that, uh, depending on uh, the, the target and on the intensity of the attack and how long it's supposed to last. So, uh, for example, here, 100 gigabit per second attack would take around 50,000 bots only. And you know, this is a kind of attack that can cripple uh, most uh, ordinary websites and uh, um, you know there are they a number of botnets that are continuously being identified with with millions of nodes so uh, um, as Fred Schreier points out with so much power attacks can be launched with devastating consequences against targets so let's look at an example of uh, infamous botnet and and try and draw some conclusions here about what all of this means. So the, the case study here is the Game, game Over Zeus uh, CryptoLocker uh, uh, rootkit slash Trojan, which created a massive global botnet. Uh, so this, this is all happening uh, in the first three years of uh, uh, the 2010, so 2011-2014. So this was an uh, encrypted peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnet uh, involving a, a, a Trojan exploit and uh, uh, involving ransomware. So computers were locked um, and files were encrypted and if the owner of the file wanted to get their data back they had to pay a certain uh, price to to the maker of uh, of the ransomware so um, it's considered often considered game over uh, as, as uh, the most advanced uh, variant of uh, a trojan called zeus and uh, uh, the botnet uh, is, uh, uh, can be uh, used to facilitate financial fraud on a large scale. Uh, you know, you have thousands to hundreds of thousands of uh, 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 machines being hijacked uh, with online banking transactions being intercepted. Um, and with these transactions being intercepted, for example, the URL uh, to the bank, the login details, including the password, and then the attackers have immediately the, the ability to, to drain that account from uh, uh, from its uh, uh, contents so um, 
Uh, this trojan is uh, spread through email and can appear under a variety of uh, guises and uh, the, uh, the key thing when it comes to CryptoLocker and to, uh, uh, to this botnet is that uh, it was exploiting the law of large numbers so you have uh, hundreds of thousands of machines being uh, infected uh, uh, you know tens of thousands of machines uh, having uh, you know, all their contents uh, encrypted uh, by, by the Trojan and as a result um, you know even if a small percentage let's say around they estimate that around 3% uh, of infected users actually paid the ransom so you can calculate what this means in the context of uh, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of uh, machines uh, uh, being uh, fully encrypted and demanding ransom so as a result what you have here is uh, um, a, a live demonstration of the ability to take control uh, and use for whatever nefarious purposes uh, a huge number of machines on the network. And uh, another thing that is important to understand here is that uh, these attacks uh, can be quite hard to notice because they they might be operating in a um, in, in, in a uh, stealth way in the sense that uh, they might be simply intercepting data uh, and uh, selling it on a, on a black market as opposed to doing something noticeable such as you know encrypting uh, people's files so that they have to pay a ransom so uh, uh, the, the issue is that you might your computer might be infected and part of a botnet for a long time without you knowing it and, and or noticing that anything is out of the ordinary and so in the in the context of uh, CryptoLocker, we have uh, an example here of a botnet of around uh, at its at its maximum around 400,000 uh, computers estimated. And uh, uh, you know again this is the, the spread is to, uh, uh, to be presumed to be global at all times, right? So because the network is global, and uh, as you see here, this is all coming from Simon Tech, from security company Simon Tech they estimate losses in the hundreds of millions of dollars so uh, whoever uh, uh, generated this attack or the group of hackers that generated the attack uh, managed to to steal hundreds of millions of dollars from from users and you know you can see the most affected countries and again the spread is global um, and the, the person uh, uh, considered responsible for the origination of the attack whether it, uh, it's he, he acted alone or, or not is another matter was uh, was this guy Evgeny Bogachev and so again you're looking at the lo losses in the hundreds of millions and the thing to understand here is that uh, uh, like I said these attacks are often stealthy in the sense that you do not immediately notice that anything is out of the ordinary so uh, in the process all sorts of details are stolen such as credit cards uh, you know, passport details uh, you have uh, trojans installed on, on computers exploits making the computers available to botnets uh, um, you know, and all of this information, all of these exploits uh, and, and data that is extracted are all for sale. So, for example, here you can see the prices for credit card credentials. So, uh, Australian credit card credentials in 2013 were going on the black market for around four US dollars per card, um, and they are usually sell, sold in bunches of tens of thousands. Uh, here you see another. A price list here for you have price lists for Trojans for exploit kits for specific purposes um, for cryptors to encrypt communications uh, scanned fake documents and you know, the list goes on and on you know you have a price list for specific types of attacks or so there's a price list for distributed denial of service attacks which depends on the, the uh, uh, duration of the attack the price changes uh, uh, prices for uh, spams for flood uh, attacks, emails overwhelming uh, mail servers, uh, for malware, for hacking of spe specific social media accounts. And uh, these price lists are again global. So the, the example given here are from the Russian uh, uh, you know, cyber criminal underground, but similar price lists can be found, uh, for example, with uh, from coming from uh, Chinese hackers so uh, here you can see again distributed denial of service attacks uh, antivirus detection malware signing 
or for example using uh, web shell packages for uh, uh, doing uh, um, SEO uh, exploits against uh, search engines so for example uh, uh, lifting a website rank to uh, in Google or in Baidu so uh, uh, the point here is that you have uh, data being stolen at uh, industrial levels and sold on the black market uh, packaged together with all sorts of other exploit or botnet services uh, which are literally sold as services is something that can be purchased um, and again these are uh, either uh, direct exploits for specific machines or specific types of operating systems or specific platforms or botnet services which are you know can be distributed in our service attacks or you know compromised hosts to be used for all sorts of different purposes and this to, to give you a sense for the kind of uh, 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 financial incentives here this uh, um, this, this uh, illicit activities uh, um, allow so we have here an example of uh, uh, one of the top online sellers of stolen credit card and debit card information uh, an individual called Maxic uh, who uh, in a US indictment unsealed in August 2009 was alleged to have earned more than 11 million US dollars over a two year period uh, only from selling stolen credit and debit card numbers so you saw the prices for an australian uh, uh, credit card were around three dollars per card now you can make the calculation of the number of uh, uh, card numbers uh, uh, being sold on the black market in order to reach this sort of sums and uh, in another example uh, here you have a, a screenshot from chat logs between uh, uh, security researcher brian krebs and um, uh, hacker who is uh, outright offering to bribe him so that he doesn't publish an article about a specific exploit that the hacker is using so you know the, in, in this context the hacker is literally offering uh, Brian Krebs $10,000 not to post his article about that specific exploit with, uh, with uh, additional information so the overall picture here that is painted is of an environment which is completely uh, uh, penetrated by exploits and uh, uh, an environment which features uh, uh, an unknown number of botnets that could be in the thousands or tens of thousands because you know security companies are continuously discovering new botnets but given the ease with which they can be created and the ease with which machines can be infected and, uh, uh, and, and turned into zombie parts of a large botnet uh, no one knows the exact number of botnets on the planet at any one time so um, this gives a sense of the environment and of the non-government if you will part of uh, 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 cyber warfare so the this phenomenon of exploits and botnets uh, uh, if you view it outside the role of the state and we'll uh, turn to the state in a second you can get a clear picture of the kind of uh, dangerous anarchic space it presents because of uh, the ease with which uh, 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 computers can be um, uh, uh, exploited, systems can be penetrated, uh, platforms can be corrupted so uh, this, this gives a sense of that and now on top of this we have uh, the state with the resources that only a state can have Right, so the picture changes spectacularly when you introduce into this environment uh, uh, state level activities with uh, uh, the kind of resources and the kind of uh, uh, ability to focus uh, uh, attention and, uh, 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 and a professional uh, 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 highly specialized kind of uh, uh, knowledge that is required so let's look at uh, cyber warfare as the domain of the state and uh, cyber warfare was a concept that uh, existed already in the early days of the global internet so here you have a time magazine cover from 1995 uh, uh, which outright declares that the u.s rushes to turn computers into tomorrow's weapon of destruction so uh, you have this notion of uh, uh, leveraging uh, the, the global uh, uh, distributed information network 
as a theater of war from the very beginning, right? So the internet, uh, if you recall the, 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 from the, the, our early discussions in the, in the cycle of lectures, the internet was always already inextricably linked to the military. But um, here you have a kind of qualitative jump in terms of thinking about the internet because the internet is not just some communication network. It, uh, is, it turns into the primary uh, 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 battle space uh, not only because of the ability to influence uh, hardware uh, and to, to penetrate systems or, or uh, attack industrial systems, as we will see down the track in this lecture, but also because it, the, of its tremendous potential to influence minds. And as we recall, the primary space, strategic space for in cyberspace is people's minds, right? The primary sp strategic space of the uh, uh, network society paradigm is people's minds. So cyber war is always already a war for people's minds. And quite instructively, as you will see down the track in the lecture, uh, cyber warfare overlaps in many respects with the criminal underground uh, when it comes to the toolkits that are being used. It's just that they're being used for completely different purposes. Right, so states, governments are really not interested in stealing credit card information, right, or demanding ransom from unsuspecting individuals. What they're interested in is uh, surveillance, subversion, subversion of discourse, subversion of, uh, of societies, subversion of systems, uh, hacking into systems, vulnerable systems, discovering vulnerabilities, uh, 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 impersonating. Uh, groups of people or individuals online attacking hardware, strategic hardware of uh, potential uh, 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 states considered enemies, the creation of botnets for these purposes, uh, what are known as zero-day attacks, so these are attacks using uh, what is known as zero-day exploits, so these are exploits which are not known at all in the wider world. Um, and. Uh, 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 exploits which have been discovered by security researchers but instead of being shared or patched they are used as uh, 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 you know entry point for an attack so these are called zero day exploits uh, potentiating zero day attacks and they are usually the most valuable exploits because no one knows about them uh, you know di again distributed denial of service attacks and the creation of sock puppets which is uh, uh, basically uh, fake identities online which can run again into the hundreds of thousands so there's a lot to unpack here and what uh, I will do in the remainder of the lecture I will be uh, unpacking, this, unpacking this phenomena but uh, I will be showing constantly the, the, the media articles that discuss them uh, because uh, chances are that a lot of this information would seem unbelievable. Uh, so it's important to show that all of this is coming from stuff that is already in the public domain and has been discussed online for a while. Um, a lot of this uh, uh, information was leaked um, through the Snowden leaks and other related leaks and we already talked about uh, 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 Snowden. Uh, also through a lot of this information has been leaked by WikiLeaks and we already talked about WikiLeaks in the previous lecture. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, something uh, known as the Hacienda program which was uh, uh, developed by uh, the GCHQ, which is a, a, a United Kingdom uh, security agency, it's quite secretive uh, spy agency, which uh, has as its uh, uh, purpose signals intelligence information uh, and signals intelligence, uh, and they uh, clearly focus on the internet. So, what is the Hacienda program? So the, this is uh, variously described as a program for internet colonization uh, and it involves uh, the, the targeted scanning not of individual computers or networks but of entire countries. Uh, so, and, and so this is uh, software which uh, leverages huge botnets and it attacks entire countries in terms of trying to scan for vulnerabilities and to exploit automatically these vulnerabilities as part of this meta goal of mastering the internet. So they literally try to attack every possible system they can. Presumably because uh, the system might reveal vulnerabilities which can be exploited to attack other systems. 
and uh, systems might be attacked simply because uh, they might eventually uh, allow an opening to something which might be valuable. So, uh, for example, you know, a library system or, or university system might be attacked simply, simply because it might eventually lead to some sort of uh, valuable discovery, uh, even if at the moment there is nothing valuable in that system. So, in effect, every device uh, on the internet is a target for attack, target for colonization. Um, and, uh, and all of this information is collected and stored uh, as, as potential exploits for, for further attacks or to uh, allowing to infiltrate another target. So um, what these, these leaks have revealed uh, that is that uh, the, the spy agencies are literally following the same methodology, the same steps that we already discussed in the context of online organized crime. So we have uh, uh, wide scanning of, uh, of systems and of machines, uh, looking for vulnerabilities, looking for specific open ports through which a machine might be penetrated uh, and, and uh, exploited. Uh, so this is followed by infection of the machine with some sort of rootkit or trojan and uh, control of the machine as part of a botnet and then eventually exfiltration if, if when valuable information is discovered and collected exfiltration and covering of tracks so that the owner of, machine, of the machine or of the system or of the network is unaware of what has happened. So here th these are slides which were actually leaked. Uh, and uh, they demonstrate that uh, uh, the, the program actually is intended to do port scans of entire countries and map using Nmap, which is a software that we uh, discussed uh, in the previous lecture, uh, to, to scan for open ports and uh, uh, in literally for every IP in a country in order to find vulnerabilities and then later exploit them. Um, Similarly, we have uh, leaks that appeared uh, in, the, uh, in the early 2011 showing that the US military uh, was, was uh, uh, already back then uh, uh, very interested in spy operations involving fake online identities. So uh, what is being discussed in this specific uh, leak is a collaboration of US military and a company called Intrepid uh, which uh, basically created uh, an automated persona generator which uh, allowed uh, an operator to control uh, uh, let's say 10 personas which are basically fake humans right these are sock puppet accounts so each persona is with coming with its own background and history and support details uh, and, and background uh, and cyber presence that are technically, culturally and geographically consistent, right? So you're looking here at, at fake humans online, but at an industrial scale. So, you know, presumably the, the uh, op operation can involve uh, tens of thousands of users, which for all intents and purposes seem to be authentic with uh, background story and with uh, support details and with uh, a range of other accounts so that if you are explore, exploring these people's background, they would appear to be authentic from a specific cultural and geographic region. Um, and the software automates the ability to create these personas uh, as if they originate in nearly any part of the world. So you're looking again at, at cultural specificities and language specificities, geographic specificities. Um, so uh, the, the other thing here is that these, these uh, uh, identities can be maintained for, for a long time with a static IP address which allows uh, uh, from the outside, for, for, uh, from a perspective of an observer, allows these personas to appear as real as possible, right? So because this, they behave like a real person uh, behind a real computer would, uh, would behave online. And so, as a result, you're looking here at the situation where a state actor like the United States would be able to leverage uh, a gigantic botnet of uh, um, fake personae, right? So these are sock puppets, uh, which can be used for all sorts of different purposes online. So they can be used to, for example, skew uh, online polls, or they, be, they can be used to generate completely fake conversations online which seem from the outside to be real, uh, fake discussions, 
uh, and they can be used to discredit uh, opponents. Let's say, for example, someone posts uh, a post which is, for example, critical of whatever uh, uh, the, the, the US government is doing. So you could have this, uh, this botnet appearing and discrediting that post. And if someone were to follow the, the each and every account in the botnet, it would appear real, right? It would appear as if these people were real humans. And so, in effect, what you're having is the creation of the semblance of consensus. So, the, uh, the, this is a tremendous power, the ability to leverage the botnet, not to, like, uh, uh, the criminal undergrounds to steal credit cards or, or, or to create ransomware, but to create the semblance of consensus, the, to create the appearance that everyone agrees with this or that specific uh, uh, idea, let's say, or this or that specific uh, point of view and this is pretty much I would say the most important realization when it comes to uh, the, the ability of cyber warfare to sway perception to modulate public perception at global scale right at, at uh, uh, unimaginable here to four levels right this is the ability to create the semblance of consensus on any issue Right? Because remember, the botnet that is being used uh, is comprised of sock puppets. Right? These are fake persona. There's nothing real here beside, be, behind this consensus. There's no people there. And this is really important because, uh, again, this is happening in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. We have these leaks appearing about... Uh, uh, the, the uh, weaponization of consensus building, the weaponization of opinions, the weaponization of uh, uh, appearances and uh, attention. Because that's what's happening in effect. And remember that we are looking here at sock puppet accounts that run into the millions and, and tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions, and we have, uh, uh, in effect, uh, uh, massive sways of public opinion presented as real, which might, for all intents and purposes, be simply, uh, uh, you know, sock puppet generated uh, uh, noise. So, uh, another example here is from, um, again, papers leaked by Snowden about uh, um, DARPA. So, this is uh, uh, the United States military's uh, research agency. Uh, and uh, its use of uh, uh, tools to create, this, again, disinformation and, and uh, uh, deception on, on an industrial scale. So here we have, uh, uh, again, literally coming out from, from the Snowden leaks, uh, proof that uh, US and British intelligence agencies have been uh, uh, using this kind of software to use social media for uh, propaganda, deception, and for opinion swaying. So this, uh, like what emerged is, is, for example, that there's a unit engaged in discrediting GCHQ's uh, uh, enemies with false information spread online. And the important thing to understand is that these are not individual cases. So this is what uh, appears in leaks, but the picture that emerges is that this is a systemic uh, a program involving a systemic approach and this is clearly not only the US government so you have to presume that all governments with enough resources to afford that are engaging in exactly the same activity so this is what cyber warfare looks like another example uh, again is uh, uh, that was leaked involves uh, uh, again the creation of this kind of fake sock puppet armies so a fake virtual army of people used to create uh, the impression of consensus online or to manipulate social media to the point where, where valuable stories are suppressed simply because you have hundreds of uh, thousands or millions of soap puppets paying attention to something else and therefore creating the impression that that something else is important and not this specific issue so uh, what in effect, what you're looking at is these gigantic operations. They are like psychological operations, in effect, perception modulation operations uh, being perpetrated by uh, various global governments uh, on attention and opinion and perception online. Right? So swaying opinions and mass and at scale 
uh, over whatever issue online in real time through the through the leverage of this type of tools and uh, what uh, there's something else also emerging here which uh, uh, emerged uh, through uh, a leak that uh, was was uh, developed by uh, the anonymous movement we talked about anonymous in the previous lecture um, so what happened is that uh, anonymous uh, uh, attacked a company called uh, uh, HB Gary and uh, so th this this company specialized in the creation of uh, uh, online persona for uh, uh, the purposes of these government agencies and uh, what emerged is the fact that uh, you have non-governmental organizations such as uh, this company that already possess software and the ability to to leverage this kind of uh, resources, this kind of massive botnets of sock puppets in order to sway opinion at will. And again, this is 2011. So uh, one of the emails that uh, Anonymous leaked, uh, uh, emails coming from HB Gary, is quite revealing when it comes to the power of this sort of non-governmental organizations to sway opinion at scale. So they call it personal management. So let's look at the kind of how, how HB Gary explains to to potential customers what is it that they actually do so uh, they uh, describe this as uh, uh, having the ability for a human actor to to open a, a virtual machine or thumb drive with an associated persona and again this is a sock puppet a fake human persona and have all the appropriate email accounts associations web pages social media accounts etc pre-established and configured with visual cues to remind the actor which persona he she is using so as not to accidentally cross-contaminate personas during use. So we are looking at a human actor who has the ability to impersonate all sorts of different fake persona which are generated on the fly by this software sold by this company uh, and these, these fake persona come with tremendous amount of detail to them uh, such as you know email accounts associations with other personae uh, web pages social media accounts etc these are pre-established and configured right, which allow the the operator to switch at will on the go between different personae in order to generate the the illusion of for example a multiplicity of people arguing around an issue um, so uh, they have uh, a capability to create a set of personae on Twitter, blogs, forums, Buzz, MySpace, under created names that fit the profile. Uh, they are maintained and updated automatically through uh, feeds, retweets, and linking together social media commenting between platforms. So you have this persona maintained automatically on the go so that it does not appear that they are in suspended uh, isolation, right? So it, it, uh, it appears that these are real people uh, uh, continuously creating information for, for uh, you know, for their uh, uh, social media network. Um, and, and let's continue with the pool of these accounts to choose from. Once you have a real name persona, you create a Facebook and LinkedIn account using the given name, lock those accounts down and link these accounts to a selected number of previously created social media accounts, automatically pre-aging the real accounts. So as an effect, what happens is that you're creating the illusion that these accounts uh, have been around for a very long time, that they, they are real. Again, you're giving them authenticity. They do not appear like random uh, uh, bots generated on the fly. They appear as real as a real human account would appear. So in effect, what happens is that they are able to use, and again, this is happening in 2011, they're able to use these uh, fake persona uh, as part of botnets where they can automate posting of content relevant to, to each persona. Um, and uh, uh, they can make it appear as if a persona was actually at a conference and introduce himself or herself to key individuals as part of the exercise. There are a variety of social media tricks we can use to add a level of realness to all fictitious personas. Again, this is happening in 2011 and the key thing here that's emerging is their the ability to create 
uh, at will and at scale completely fake uh, uh, individual persona, which can be then aggregated, staggered into, into a botnet to create the, the effect of a large group of real people uh, with real interests um, uh, exchanging information with each other or, or uh, uh, you know, agreeing on an issue or debating an issue and coming to a consensus. Right? The key thing here is that this is uh, uh, all fake and all created for a specific targeted psychological operation against a specific uh, demographic, let's say, or a specific uh, society. So um, the, the value proposition here that emerges is, again, in, in a, a stark difference from the online criminal underground, which is focused on extracting immediate uh, monetary gains from uh, the exploited machines, from the botnets that are being uh, uh, leveraged, is to, to sway attention. So clearly you have social and political purposes uh, at the forefront as opposed to some sort of uh, monetary gain. Right? The, the ability to sway attention, opinion and perception is what is of primary importance here. And we see this again and again in these leaks that appear through Snowden and through, uh, through Wikileaks. So here we have, uh, again, part of the GCHQ's uh, 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 leaks that, uh, that uh, Snowden made. Uh, we have uh, what emerges is, uh, uh, again, tools to seed the internet with false information, including the ability to manipulate the results of online polls, artificially inflate page view counts on websites, amplify sanctioned messages on YouTube, and censor video content judged to be extremist. So again, these are automated tools which are able to create uh, this kind of long-term uh, effects on a population. So think of this systemically in the context of the attention economy and everything we've discussed so far uh, about uh, uh, the uh, network society part of that. Think of the effects of this kind of operation in that context. So in, when you're thinking about that, think about the scale that is available to these agencies, which is way beyond the event horizon of uh, uh, you know, the criminal underground, right? because here we have the leveraging of state-level resources. So here is another example um, the, uh, uh, that, that again emerged with the Snowden leaks. So here we have uh, uh, tactics, and these are self-identified tactics as defined by the, the uh, GCHQ spy agency itself. Um, to, to uh, control, infiltrate, manipulate, and warp online discourse, right? So uh, uh, the first tactic to inject all sorts of false material onto the internet in order to destroy the reputation of targets and or to use social sciences and other techniques to manipulate online discourse and activism to generate outcomes it considers desirable. So they might use false flag operations, posting material to the internet and falsely attributing it to someone else. Uh, fake victim blog posts, pretending to be a victim of the individual or the organization or the country whose reputation they want to destroy and posting negative information on various forums, right? So we have uh, these appear not as a, uh, as a one-off things, right? So the important thing to realize is that these are automated uh, uh, software platforms which allow this to be done on an industrial scale over very long periods of time, over years, right, of continuous posting in order to create uh, the appearance of a reality which is com completely contrived, right, none of this is actually real or authentic. And again, to, to, uh, I want to emphasize that this is not something which is limited to uh, a few governments, this is a global phenomenon um, and uh, every government with the, the, the resources available uh, is, is involved, right? So we have similar stuff happening uh, in, in uh, uh, Russia and similar stuff happening in China. So in the Chinese example here, we have uh, um, uh, the, the leveraging again of, of software and of gigantic armies of online censors who scour the internet for bad news and then negate it in order to shape public opinion. So there, there are all sorts of case studies that have emerged already. And here is an example from an article in the BBC that, uh, uh, you know, when facing a, a undesirable comment or undesirable information on Chinese social media, you have the immediate convergence 
of uh, this sort of either real uh, human sensors or uh, uh, sock puppet uh, uh, accounts part of a botnet which converge on that specific thread in order to post their own comments that shift the debate, that immediately neutralize the undesirable opinion. So this is, again, the ability to, uh, on the fly, in real time, shift discourse, manipulate perception, uh, in order to define how populations see reality and define where the attention of population is focused. On top of that, we have what we talked about earlier, which is the uh, the, the, the fact that the information uh, once, once posted online stays online, the internet doesn't forget. So uh, we have, uh, uh, um, again, agencies with the resources available, like for example the NSA in the United States, being able to build uh, um, search engines of their own, they, they call them Google-like uh, uh, engines. Uh, so uh, uh, in the, in the NSA example, and again, this is part of the Snowden leaks, uh, this enabled analysts to uh, run searches against particular selectors associated with a person of interest, such as an email address or phone number, and receive a page of results displaying a list of phone calls made and received by a suspect over a month-long period. So these results can be used to review all sorts of information about the person, their social network, the, the people they communicate with, etc., etc. So we have these massive operations, global scale, uh, um, lasting uh, for years uh, and focused on the manipulation of public opinion. And uh, uh, apart from that, we have, uh, and, and again, this is, this is one part you could describe, uh, one part of uh, cyber warfare. And the other side of cyber warfare is uh, the, the, the ability to attack machines again. So this overlaps a lot with, uh, in fact, over overlaps completely in terms of the, the methodology being used with the uh, criminal uh, online underground. However, the, the intentions are different, right? So it's not about stealing uh, credit card information or bank details here. It's about directly attacking critical infrastructure. So the case study, the classic case study here is the Stuxnet worm, uh, which uh, was discovered uh, in 2010-2011, uh, uh, so this was a, a, a worm which uh, attacked Iran's nuclear facilities at uh, uh, the Natanz nuclear plant and what emerged, so initially it was unclear what is actually happening, but what emerged uh, uh, after careful investigation by a variety of different uh, uh, network security researchers is that this was uh, uh, um, focused cyber warfare attack against the industrial control systems of uh, a, a nuclear processing plant, right? So this was the direct attack on the critical infrastructure of, uh, of a state, in this case, Iran. And uh, how this attack worked is really interesting. Uh, so this was, uh, it was designed to be transmitted through uh, USBs. And uh, um, so this USB, so you, you had infected USBs infected with the specific Stuxnet worm uh, and once uh, the USB was connected to, to a computer, the Stuxnet worm would upload itself to the operating system and would start looking for specific uh, industrial control systems. And if these were absent, it wouldn't do any other damage to the computer apart from replicating itself to all other USBs and to the network in the search for these industrial control systems. And once it found these industrial control systems, in this context, these were made by a German company called Siemens, it uh, attacked the uh, programmable lo uh, logic control uh, elements of, of uh, uh, these systems and uh, 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 basically programmed them to send new instructions to, to the machines to which they were attached. Uh, so these were, in effect, uh, uh, the uh, machines in the uh, nuclear processing plants in Natanz. And the idea was that these should uh, disrupt temperature monitors uh, and uh, uh, cause uh, a catastrophic failure, which, in fact, did happen. So the attack was successful. And so uh, 
it, over 2010, this is unfolding and 2011, 2012, people started researching what is actually happening and what emerged is a, a focused cyber warfare attack on Iran that was sanctioned by President Obama's uh, government. And uh, yeah, what, what emerged after um, researchers started analyzing these systems, uh, the infected systems, is that uh, uh, the specific Trojan, right, the Stuxnet uh, Trojan, had spread uh, across the globe to all sorts of uh, uh, industrial systems. So they, you had uh, uh, Russian nuclear power plants in, being infected, uh, in even the International Space Station's computers were infected with the Stuxnet uh, uh, Trojan, which was looking, uh, again, constantly for Siemens uh, industrial control systems. So uh, here you have a map of the machines globally which were infected by Stuxnet, with uh, uh, obviously here you have Iran as the primary target. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is an example of uh, uh, probably the first of its kind and the first of probably many to follow uh, cyber warfare attacks against critical infrastructure. So again, these are attacks against critical infrastructure. So not this, you cannot get any more critical when it comes to infrastructure than uh, uh, nuclear power stations and, and nuclear, uh, uh, you know, uh, centrifuge processing facilities, right? So um, uh, what emerges is uh, the ability to attack remotely, uh, bloodlessly, if you will, uh, infrastructure critical to the existence of uh, entire states, to entire societies and create and cause uh, 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 irreparable damage to these states and societies remotely uh, by leveraging uh, cyber warfare capabilities. And um, as Eugene Kaspersky, the head of uh, uh, the uh, Kaspersky lab, which is a security network security lab, uh, describes and he, his lab is the, the, the lab where you know the, the core capabilities of the Stuxnet uh, uh, rootkit were analyzed. As he describes this, we, in the past there were cyber criminals and now I'm afraid it's the time of cyber terrorism, cyber weapons and cyber wars. Uh, this piece of malware was designed to sabotage plants to damage industrial systems. And this is the beginning of a new world. Nine, the 90s were a decade of cyber vandals. So we have here the early hackers and the distributed denial of service attack against, uh, uh, attacks against uh, individual websites. The 2000s were a decade of cyber criminals. So here we have, again, credit cards and uh, ransomware, etc. I'm afraid now it is a new era of cyber wars and cyber terrorism. So this is, this is where we are right now. Cyber wars, cyber terrorism, the ability to attack critical infrastructure remotely to, to literally destroy uh, a state's uh, uh, core abilities remotely, such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, power plants, uh, water treatment plants, etc., etc., um, and the ability to attack en masse an entire population's uh, uh, perceptions, the ability to manipulate uh, their attention to manipulate how they see the world, to manipulate at will in real time their opinions through gigantic sock puppet botnets. So let's reassess what emerges so far from uh, everything we've discussed in this lecture. Uh, first and foremost, we have cyber war emerging as the default state of the network. Uh, you can, you can visualize it bottom-up as the continuous operation of uh, cyber criminals globally. And uh, from the top, uh, the, the, the organized, uh, um, for intents and purposes, infinitely funded uh, uh, operations of state actors against each other and each other's societies. So cyber war is the default state of the internet. Every possible system will be attacked by state and non-state actors, presumably continuously attacked, continuously scanned for exploits. Every device, potential target for colonization. And that device might be everything from a computer to a laptop, tablet, smartphone, uh, 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 smart home systems such as Alexa or Google Home, uh, you know, smart light bulbs, 
anything connected to the internet. A potential target for attack. Uh, vulnerabilities are exploited through uh, uh, Trojan botnets, which uh, leverage the, the, uh, the, the power and uh, uh, processing uh, abilities of, of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of computers. And we have the phenomenon of consensus manipulation at scale and well poisoning, right? the, the destruction of uh, 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 people's uh, uh, reputations online through false persona botnets, right? So the ability of state actors and non-state actors as well to leverage large uh, sock puppet uh, botnets in order to uh, create uh, all, all consensus around all sorts of uh, different uh, uh, issues at will in real time and to uh, destroy reputations and sway opinions. Uh, this is it from me on the on the uh, topic of uh, 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 the darker side of the network society paradigm. If you have any questions, please reach me at Admit you on Twitter. Thank you all for listening and see you online.